Daim in Amsterdam. Und mit uns ist Michel Weiswitz, der seit den 80er Jahren äh, am Stein sehr involviert ist. Seit, seit den 60ern sogar, aber seit den 80ern in leitender Funktion, richtig? Oder? Ähm, ja. ja. Und ähm, heute wird er uns einige Fragen beantworten, die hoffentlich auch aus der Runde kommen werden. Ähm, ich bitte einfach um Handzeichen, wie wir es in den Seminaren bisher auch gehabt haben, wer eine Frage ist. Ähm, und dann unterbreche ich kurz. Und ah, I'm sorry, Michel. <lacht> Michel, uh, does speak German, but his, Eng his English is way better, so let's uh, just switch to English today. Um, uh, in case there's any questions from the audience, from any of you, please just raise your hand, as we had it in the seminars um, always, and I'll interrupt and um, let you ask a question. Um, first of all, I'd like to show a small video, which I recorded yesterday when uh, Michel was playing in the Musikrebau, in the new um, music building here in Amsterdam. He was playing in the um, Gaudiamus Festival, and he was playing a, um, a show with his instruments, the hands, which uh, he has brought um, here today, and he, uh, which he will also show later and explain in detail, technically and musically. And um, first of all, I would like to to show this video which I recorded yesterday that we all get an impression of um, who we are having here next to us. So I start the, bro the browser and this should um, start all your browsers. Ah. Wolf hat eine Frage. Dann starten wir das Bild einfach noch nicht im, im Browser. Wolf, bitte, ja. Rolf, hattest du eine Frage? Rolf, did, sorry, did you have a question? If not, we can just start this in this browser window, which we have all open now. We can just start the play button and see Michelle's concert from yesterday. Does everybody see the browser window? Yes? Konnten das Video alle sehen? Uh, could, every, sorry, could everybody follow the video in the browser? Why do okay. I hear anything? Um, we don't hear any signal from you. We don't hear any, any um, sound and I don't see any chat except for the yes. Okay. So let's just continue. Yeah, Mich Michael in Bern is showing a thumbs up. So let's just continue. Um, Michel, can you 
can you please explain to us, um, both technique-wise and also musically, what inspired you to, to build this instrument, which, we, which we've just seen, seen the hand? Oh, that's really a long story. What, what are you specifically interested in? For example, I would like to know... Um, ah, sorry. That's why I'm fighting with technics. I didn't push the reset the speed button. Leider kein Ton ab, okay. Now there should be some sound from here. Can you hear me now? Okay. So what I was just asking, Michel, <laughs> is... Uh, um, I'd like to know what inspired you technically and musically to build these hands and um, this is a very a very huge question I know but maybe we can approach this by um, ex that, that, that you explain to us which parameters are um, controllable with your interface and which um, uh, which kind of sensors and switches and whatever you apply to this instrument uh, Indeed uh, yeah. we can hear you Can you hear me now? Okay, now it's now it's better. It seems it seems to switch off from time to time. Okay, so let's just let's just get back to the Kommt der Sound in Bern an? Does Bern get get the sound, Michael? Do you hear us? Okay, there's a thumbs up. So um, I'm sorry, Michelle. Auch aus Amsterdam der Sound. Michael, hörst du den Sound aus Amsterdam? Michael, do you hear me in Amst from Amsterdam? Yeah. Okay, let's just continue and please get into um, <laughs> a brief description of um, what kind of sensors and switches and whatever Michel um, implemented in this sophisticated interface. Can you explain this? Well, it's not such a sophisticated interface at all, but do, do we really have to talk technically uh, about this? Is this so important? <coughs> I think this is important. As in the last lessons, we've had um, all kinds of introductions of sensors, which they are, and how, how they can be used. And I can see lots of different sensors which you use in this um, interface, so maybe it would be good to have this small technical description yeah. uh, of, of this. If this uh, is interesting for you, you can also describe it in a different way. Yeah, I, I always, um, um, I mean, this is about music, of course, and um, uh, there is a relationship uh, between my personal musical history and, and the desire at the time that I grew up, the electronic music was something that was uh, actually not really existing. It was kind of created in, in, a, in a kind of pot, and you couldn't see it, and ingredients were put in, and what came out was in a frozen form almost, and, and I, I felt like uh, what was missing was this idea that you could really um, bring you know, your brain activity and your body activity kind of together with the creation of sound. And uh, there has been an experience where um, I took LSD, yeah. and indeed there was like sounds at some point flowing into the room. There was music on, and uh, it, it floated in the room, and I could touch those sounds. And and when I would touch the sound, they would change. And of course, this was uh, under the influence of, of chemicals, and um, it wasn't um, it was real enough as an experience, but I couldn't repeat it uh, and and share that with other people. So, and there is another experience that is when I was very young uh, with my brother and I, we we played with my father's uh, radios. He was a researcher in chemistry, in medical chemistry, but he had all these shortwave receivers and transmitters in the home, and we, we sometimes managed to steal some of those machines. And uh, it, during the night, um, when the parents were asleep, we would, we would kind of wake up and turn these radios on. Yes, this, this all explains um you're, you're very much interest for um, for electronic music and for interacting with sound in your special way, but how, why did it lead especially to this um, this um, pair of wooden things which we see next to you? 
Well, be because it, it couldn't be done in a simpler way. It, it, unfortunately, we had to go uh, and develop technology uh, to try to reach this idea that that you would have an instrument that could really navigate and form and interact with sound. Of course, the whole history of musical instruments was about pitch and rhythm. And, uh, and I think my brother and I were very much uh, interested by, by this that by the hypnotic effect of shortwave sound, but also sometimes of just having a little piece of paper and, and touching it in your hand or having a little pipe. Or we actually um, took our parents' uh, piano and, and took away the keyboard and, and started playing on the strings with little engines and, and, and put uh, guitar microphones like magnetic elements over the strings. And we discovered all these sounds, and we would make uh, like sound um, streams for hours. And then you discover that there is no instrument to properly deal with sound. I mean, the idea of having a, a synthesizer with a keyboard, and a keyboard that has this whole history, uh, partly coming from church dogmas and and, and other rules and laws, uh, and that in a way had nothing to do with sound, you know, with, with navigation and creation of sound, it was a very difficult period. And the other way, when I grew up, like in the 50s and 60s, was you know to, to go into an electronic music studio and to, to construct this melting pot layer by layer of sound. And, and that was a very formalist approach that, that, um, that is, uh, you know, it, in a way it doesn't exist anymore that way. And, and um, it is something that, that is now almost inconceivable that it was the only way of making electronic music. So if you skip um, a, a little period, then you see that I have made some early um, electronic instruments where you touch the circuitry, mm -hmm. and we were traveling around with it. And, and we'll it come to that also later in the yeah. interview, I hope so. And, uh, no, but I can tell about it now. I mean, yes, it's, sure. it's a point where, um, where these, um, these instruments could be taken on stage and on tour. And there were, there's been a moment where, you know, there was like six, seven people on stage in the world with electronic instruments. And it was, a, we knew the few people that I met of those, those groups, you know, like the Musica Electronica Viva, and you know, like yeah. Richard Teitelbaum, and, and, and Alvin Curran also, and some other people. We knew that this was a thing to come. And it's interesting to maybe mention it because Luckily, now there's so many people more. Ja, war da gerade eine Frage? Habe ich hier meinen Ton gehört? Gut. Keine Frage soweit. Können alle folgen? Kommt der Ton überall an? Ja, wir sehen ein paar Handzeichen, sonst aber nur Stille. Gut. Wir waren dabei, dass ähm, du beschreibst gerade die Möglichkeit, des, der, der äh, elektronischen Musik mitzunehmen, sie, sie, äh, sie mit, mit, mit auf die Bühne zu nehmen, ähm, im Gegensatz zu den, zu den großen Studiosynthesizern der, der 60er Jahre, 50er, 60er yeah, Jahre. What, what, um The, the, what was no, really I'm, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Sorry, sorry okay. to switch to German again. Can, yeah, if you can get the German and you answer in English, it's, I'm sorry. It's totally fine. No, you don't have to be sorry. It's fine. We live in a multicultural country, yeah. I hope. Um, the, it is possible now, you know, to take your electronics everywhere. And uh, But I'm from a time where that wasn't possible and where, where, you know, you had to invite some friends to come to the studio to play you there a tape or they could bring the tape somewhere. And that had a very intimate side, but this idea that you're in a hall with people and that you play a piece and that you can really respond to what you get from the audience, the kind of vibrations in the air, but also the response from the people. You, you listen to people's breathing when, when you play, you know, every traditional instrumentalist can tell this stuff, but in the electronic music history, this, this got totally lost. Actually, some people really appreciated this because it was, you know, a music that came also very close from serialism and from the desire to sort of control every aspect of music and 
and even rather not have the interference of musicians. Now, the moment that for me is very important is that Bruno Maderna, the, you know, the Italian composer, but also especially conductor, was working a lot in Amsterdam in the 60s, and, and he was the one to point out to some of the composers here that it was a bad development that, that you know, electronic music happened in studios where composers would be assisted by engineers and scientists to make music and that musicians didn't have a say in the development of electronic music. And uh, he thought that, uh, that the knowledge of musicians, you know, not just about um, you know, interpretation of music, but also in, about relationship with an audience, what happens when you're on stage with an audience was a very important factor that was really missing in the development of electronic music. And, and would, this, uh, would, would you um, compare the, the, um, the, um, the process which a musician has to go through to become a, a very um, <coughs> elaborate um, instrumentalist on his instrument to be able to communicate with the audience? Would you compare, or how would you categorize it, comparing this to somebody who builds his own instrument, who deals with computers, who deals with mapping of um, different kinds of data, to interpret them musically. Is this, um, for you, a comparable process, learning a traditional instrument to communicate or to feel the no. strength of the audience which you described, no. and sitting behind the screen and, and mapping, um, mapping data? Well, I think that, um, I don't think, I think if you're thinking about mapping data on stage, you're, you're kind of lost. Yeah. That's not, not what you think about. I think now there is a one, I mean, I was really talking about the past until now. Right now we're in a totally different situation. What, um, what's, what is right now for you? Uh, right now, these days. And um, I think you have many different types of practices. The, I mean, since a lot of the music development, especially in electronica, uh, the, the whole laptop culture, what we call laptop electronica, has come also from people who come from the visual arts. The whole concert practice has changed. You know, for instance, there's this kind of thing that uh, what I call reception con concerts, you know, like party concerts, where this idea is that people just talk and, and communicate with themselves and the music is somewhere in the background and the DJ or, or the musician is sort of, you know, catering like a cook from, from behind or wherever. You call this reception. Uh, yeah, because it's, yeah. It's, it's this idea that, uh, you know, the artist is not in a central position. And, and so there is a kind of, it's, you could also call it catering music, I mean, and just to, and uh, um, th 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 we, I mean, that is one practice. The other practice is that, you know, what's been of huge influence is indeed the dance culture, where um, the DJ in the beginning was happy to be, you know, like if you listen to the early locust uh, period, you see that he wanted to be in the dark and hide behind images and sound. And, this idea that, that the, the performer is not anymore the central kind of dictator on stage uh, is something really new and important and is something that also some of us has worked about, you know, that, that you could have different practices. And I'm um, more from, uh, I think, uh, a, a direction where I, I'm, I feel like I'm a storyteller and I want to tell a kind of story and, and, and probably my best language is sound. You, you were one of the few um, musicians in the festival that started their, con their concert with a small speech talking to the, to the audience in the microphone. I think you were the only one using a microphone before playing. So this seems to be very important to you to get in, in touch literally with, with the audience. Yeah, yeah, but it's also because um, I felt like um, this live electronic music festival, I noticed that a lot of pieces were, were like composed and, and performed and that, are, that they had little room for, uh, for improvisation. And, and for me, live electronic music um, is, is an area where we try to find solutions for you know, this idea that composing is not anything like 19th century behind your desktop at home and there is another instrument like the orchestra or the ensemble or a group of musicians of any kind that will perform it for you. I think we're in a period where, where a lot of us want to be on stage, and but we want to be the composer, we want to be the conductor, and we want to be the musician. 
And you know, if you look at the beginning of, of uh, new music, where where you know, if we think about the 50s, you had a person like uh, Pierre Boulez, who was totally against improvisation, because he felt uh, you know, renewment, invention wouldn't come from improvisation, because as a composer, you can be at home and reflect on what you do, and you have the time to think. Now we know by now that some of us can think very fast. And that with the help of computers on stage that, that have like some material already ready for you to perform, but the material uh, can be molded and manipulated live, uh, the system can even analyze what you're doing and respond and interact what you're doing, like systems like George Lewis and Clarence Barlow have designed in the, in the 80s and 90s of the last century. So the, the technology can help us with that reflection so that you can be on stage and you don't have to hit every note yourself. You can also sort of be there and be kind of an operator, almost like a manager of your music or like a conductor if you want. So that is a huge change. And so this idea that, that, that you can merge uh, composition and, and performance into one, which I call, call still composing the now, and uh, it, the word improvisation is, of course, very biased and, and has devaluated a lot. And uh, comp composition still means something to me. And uh, so the, uh, the idea of composing the now, which is a bit of a paradox, but with the help of technology and, and a mindset that really you know, can be there on stage, can be present. Now, there's different types of, of involvement. You know, you can have... Uh, people that um, play, uh, you know, they start a tape or they start a, a hard disk recording and they just play it and they just start it and they stop it. Well, that's very little involvement. You can have somebody who, you know, sort of interferes with the material that he starts and triggers, but you can also... Is, is, is this what, what, you, what you meant by, by your vocabulary touch, which you and Stein developed? This... This, this direct interference, which is more than, than just playing, playing back devices on stage? Well, well the, what I'm describing is that you have a whole range. You can say you, you can start a sound and it will go on for a few minutes and you don't interfere. Yeah. And at the other end, is like every move in the sound, every development in the sound is resulting from an interaction of you. Like even a violin for, uh, you know, has, a, has a process of its own. You know, a violinist knows that you have to get the string to sound and so it, you're interacting with that timing of the string, and that is, of course, a fraction of microseconds. But I have heard, like DJs, that, that you know, maybe press a button uh, every 20 seconds, which is not a very intense interaction, but their timing was excellent. I've heard people who do you know, constant interference, but with no heart for the sound, which is bad. You know? I'm not against uh, laptop culture, as a lot of people from my generation are, because they feel like it's, it doesn't have this, this really nice relationship between the physical and the mind. I think that is, that is, uh, there's nothing negative in it, as long as somebody really has a good timing for doing things, and that timing is good if it also works with an audience. That, that is my personal um, kick, you know, if you... If you manage to find what is going on in an audience in terms of musicality, and it can be a big space or a small space. And uh, so you want the technology, to come back to your original question, yeah. that, uh, that allows you to, to translate your physical and mental actions as directly and as quickly as needed to have a sharp timing, have a sharp musical timing. And we know that musical timing is a matter of milliseconds. So that's why, if I'm looking at our, our uh, you know, uh, conversation here through the net, the internet is still not really a very musical medium because you know you, you want immediacy in in the terms that that something can ha go into a groove with very fine musical detail and it really feel okay this is exactly the right moment. So this is why I I had to go into technology a lot. And going into technology is also stepping in another world, it's stepping into you know, a logical world, it's stepping into a world of, of, of machines that break down, and human beings break down too, but they have a bit more capabilities of getting up again themselves. 
And with machines, if they break down, uh, or if you forget to press a button or yeah. whatever, they're, they're, they're very dumb. They're, they're really not helpful. So you have to go into that technology because it can do something for you. But I can see also that the danger of it is that you get totally entangled in the technology. So if you look in the 50s and 60s, you could see that some of the composers were learning to you know, program themselves and there were pieces were called after the software or after special formulas. People got totally you know, uh, hypnotized by, by their own technologies. And worse is that you know, when you have then suddenly there's an incredible explosion of musical technology in the 90s and more recently, you see that indeed people get overwhelmed by the software and if you look in the history of techno music, you can totally see with which software it was made and recognize all yeah, the... Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Still in techno music, many people call their music like their plugins or yeah. the software. So, yeah. so this is why I think it's very important that, um, that you take the development of the technology in your own hand. So, like for instance, Stein has done a lot uh, to help people to develop their own instrument, to, to really say, well, well, we'll create a number of building blocks that can be software, or it can be like a hardware interface to, to attach sensors to your computer. And, but the idea is that, that we would stimulate to, and really focus on one person, and, and maybe even only for one piece, build an instrument. So that, this, the, the, that the physical relationships needed to do the music uh, would be optimally translated into good music. And, and that, of course, is, is a job in itself. This, this whole idea, why do you want it to be physical? Now, a lot of people think that, you know, if I play that instrument, as you just showed, I, wanted, I did that because it gives a show, it's more theatrical. Uh, some people think, you know, if you start moving around, it, it is, is good and stuff. For, for the show, for the image. And that's, a, uh, for me, a total misunderstanding. That's also why in my introduction I told people, if you feel like closing your eyes, close your eyes. There's no slides, there's no, no image. It's about music. So the reason I wanted um, to develop instruments, and we can go into more detail for the instruments, that, that you know, translate this physicality into the, the more formal electronic world, is simply that in our instinct, in our, in our body, in our mus muscles, there is an incredible amount of intelligence. If we had to calculate by hand, by head, the, the pressure applied you know, by a finger, uh, you'll be busy for hours while a finger can do really quite perfect logarithms. And, and you know, there's, there's an incredible intelligence in your, in your fingers to begin with. And um, that really um, was something that totally was missing. And, and I thought it was important. It doesn't mean that everything has to become totally physical, but it, there, there, it was working on a, on a, on a balance that, that you know, the musicality wouldn't get lost. And we discovered uh, things, what I'm saying is not just like wasn't an instinct. You know, what we did at some point, uh, this is in the early 80s when, when MIDI was just invented, um, we had this keyboard, and then you have on the keyboard you have this perfect little uh, pitch band wheel uh, that does a glissando. Now imagine you strike a chord and it sounds orchestral, and you make the whole orchestra play a glissando. That that yeah, it's possible. But if you go to a real symphony orchestra and you take the instruments that can do the glissando, and if the orchestra managed to do a perfect unisono glissando, which I once heard, it's an incredible experience because it is this mental focus of all the musicians, it's their physical, because it's not easy to do that, you know, to have exactly this unisono pitch graph. Now, and there you are standing behind the synthesizer, you have your thumb roll over that, that thing. So what we did as an, almost as a joke, and later it became a bit more serious instrument, is that we replaced the pitch band wheel by a huge handle that would have, uh, you know, like like uh, a friction plate. So like you would have to really make effort to like pull cock, like a cockpit, uh, a plane, yeah. a plane uh, aircraft. Yeah. But this was much rail. bigger, like old train, uh, uh, you know, railway uh, handles. I think I've seen an image of this. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. And um, then it turned out that uh, that if you would play the recordings made with the handle or with the pitch band, everyone could immediately recognize 
the ones that were done with the handle because in a way they were more musical. Now I'm not advocating that um, to make good music you have to be very strong. Uh, it, it's not about the strongest, it's not about the, the power, but it's about how do you manage your physical energy. So, so it's about you know somebody who, who plays extremely well that is recognized by a lot of people, also people who don't know about music that much, but they understand that there is an incredible interaction, there's a mastering, there's a virtuosity. And, 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 and also lots, lots of the musical energy comes from the power supply, because it's, it's, it's the, the electronic music doesn't use your muscles, your effort to, to, to move the string, to, to pull yeah. down the hammer anymore, so maybe this is also <coughs> a motivation for you to to bring back the effort into the music, well, not, not just to, to push a, 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 an easy pushable button and then it's it? The, the whole effort um, matter and energy matter is something for our near future. We have uh, in the 80s and 90s we've worked a lot on this energy matter but not in a radical enough way and that is why now there's so much electronic music that easily gets this power from the main, uh, you know, the communal powerhouse in the city through our power sockets in the wall and that it's so easy to go and listen to pieces that last for hours because nobody gets too tired to go and play it. <laughs> and um, and it's, so there's really uh, almost a lack of economy there also because you can just keep pulling this power. Now in a way, luckily for the music, our power systems get less reliable. So, you know, with all the power surges when winter comes in or, or storms come in, it's not so strange and with maybe the future of our political systems um, that also in Western Europe and North America and Japan suddenly there is no power. That would also mean there is no electronic music anymore unless you start thinking about that. And it's true that if we make a quick little jump to our future, we, it's time we have started research in this idea that you have uh, really independently operating uh, electronic instruments that that are powered, we have done a lot on little mobile instruments powered on batteries, but I'm very interested to do a research on this whole energy matter. So what is the influence of the energy source on musical expression? And I thought the best way to, uh, to try this is to say as a, as a research dogma, Let's not use power from the power uh, supply anymore. Let's uh, generate the energy ourselves. And that can be the musician and that can be the audience as well. So you could have your, your audience work and you get immediately very interesting social interaction because if the audience get tired of your music, they might stop providing you. You mean, you mean the audience sit on bicycles and, and work all the time? Yes. To make these. EPA, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or they walk around and by shaking something they make energy. You know, people can, you have a kind of energy that you can get out of the movement of people. You yeah. could even have a dancing crowd to produce quite a lot of energy. And as long as they dance, the music is running. Yeah, so it's a very nice recursive process. And uh, But if you look, uh, there's, it has a, some very nice consequences. That is that people will be, you know, since one single person doesn't produce that much what, you know, not that much energy. So the music will be actually quite soft, which is, you know, can be very nice in electronic music and quite unusual. Um, uh, the, the phrasing and the whole economy of, of you know, what you do um, will, will be, you know, will need to be managed in a different way. Now, I'm not saying that this is the future of electronic music. I think um, with all this beautiful gear and software and and instruments, it's, it's a very important research to do because um, it's, it will make people aware of this relationship. How Because people now don't think about the fact that this energy flow is going there all the time and, and it totally shapes uh, the, the presence of electronic music. I mean, the, the, I, I think if you only would look at the average length of electronic music performances compared to more traditional music performances, you will see that it's much higher once it's powered by the by, by the communal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but this is just for the for the future research also done at Stein. This is this is what what your thoughts are heading now. This has nothing to do this this um, power supply communal thoughts have nothing to do with your instruments which we are going to look at so far the the hands on the crackle box. Yeah. Or, or is it already in there that 
It, I would say it's a little bit in there, but, but the, the developments we've had until now are more about um, are getting in touch, uh, getting into an interaction with the instrument. So instead of, you, you, won't, you won't hear me use the word control in a very positive sense. I, I, I don't believe that we control our instruments, neither the traditional instruments. I mean, if we could control it, you probably wouldn't even have to learn it. I mean, so what, what is it which you do with, with your computer on stage? You also use your computer on stage when you use the hands. And what, what is this um, data flow? Well, this <laughs> the, 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 com the, the computer has, has, uh, has a, as a building block of, of my instrument, has a number of functions. And it's a storage place of a lot of the sounds. And in my case, I use a lot of uh, short sound fragments. And my, my practice is both in the studio, for hours and hours I work on sounds in the studio, and they're quite often short little bursts for f between half a second or four seconds. And on stage I will call them up and, and play them and pile them up or stretch them or mold them, filter them, uh, you know, juxtapose different sounds at the same time. So they're really like kind of like in food, freeze-dried, ready to be used, and, uh, and on stage I will call them up and, and bring them together. So it, you could say it's a kind of really stretched type of granular synthesis, only it's more like brick synthesis, it's, it's building blocks. And, um, and that means that, so the, the, the computer is in my case like a, it's a library where, where, or an arsenal where these sounds are stored and they can be retrieved. So it's also it has a navigation system. So the instrument that I play has, has also one very important function that, that I can go into my, my uh, sound history because there's a lot of sounds stored in the computer. Also, very often during concerts, I, I do some of live sampling and those sounds make it into the system. And so there will be sounds of people that I play with or something in the audience. It is sounds that I pick up sort of everywhere while traveling. And then, um, then the next phase is that these sounds are taken out of that library and brought into, uh, you know, the real musical part of the instrument. That is where um, they can be manipulated by, by you know, the, the, the hands. In this case, this yeah. whole sensor instrument. So the computer then is used to translate the gestures uh, that I make into music. And in itself, the computer does not. Uh, make decisions at the moment for like in terms of compositional, uh, um, you know, strategies. It, it is basically an, really like a translator. It's there waiting for input for me, and it will help me to manipulate the sounds. And and that is about it. I'm I'm working with pallets of sound where a number of sounds is ready to be played immediately, so I don't have to fetch them. And you could say these are part of the presets. And I'm working on a system where, um, because now I select these sounds for a concert. I, I, I have these palettes ready and it's, they each are like about 40 seconds of music. And like in last night's concert, I used about 12 of them. Mm -hmm. And that is a selection that's made. And if I would have to look to replace one of those palettes from the library, it would take me about two seconds if I know where it is, and that is too long. So I'm working on a system here at Stein where, um, the, the where I will tag those sounds with special values, I mean, with several values uh, relating to their sound family, uh, to the use that I, I intend to make with it. And the system will be able to present me in every, any kind of situation, will quickly get sounds uh, from the library and present them during the piece so that I get suggestions from the machine. Ah, maybe try this one because then you thought it would work. Yeah. And then it will build up a history of what I did. And so that's another role of the computer that it will um, uh, build up this this experience, okay, you use that sound, you didn't use that one, so we might bring it up because you didn't use it, or we might not bring it up because you haven't used it anyway. So so it could build up a character that it reflects on what you've been doing with its suggestions. So that is the next step in, in the software that I'm thinking about, and that is sort of what a computer does, but you see the computer doesn't make any 
a real musical decision on the spot so that all the musical actions are triggered and manipulated by myself on stage. But when you say this software becomes a character because it sees things which you do and which you don't do and draws conclusion out of this, then it's... I have a problem with the vocabulary character because it's 100% programmed, of course. It's a digital machine, so how can you... How can we experience the computer like somebody who is having a fixed idea or just a quick idea and influence thought on what you do like a real person, a character would do? Is it really the same for you? This is not just my invention. Our minds work very interestingly. We fill in a lot of gaps in information that we get. You know, paranoia people miss some important information here and there and that makes that they see very complex information and dangerous information and lots of information and the lack of observation makes it that they can do this process. Now that is a sick way, although sometimes paranoia people also see things that are really dangerous. I mean, there's a very strange area and in that same strange area, for instance, fishermen in the Mediterranean used to paint like kind of spooky figures on their boats to scare some dangerous animals in the water and so that they could catch the right ones. Puppeteers, I've spoke with Roman Pasqua, who is a puppeteer from New York who also worked with Bob Wilson and we had a long conversation because we both tried to animate that material at the end of wires. You know, he has his little pieces of cloth and I have my little electronic silicon parts and we had long talks because we saw a lot of similarities and Roman pointed out that when he did series of performances with his puppets that sometimes he would have the feeling that the puppets didn't want to play that with him. So this kind of animistic thinking is quite, is not that unknown to musicians as well. You know, a lot of us are, you could call it superstitious, but maybe it's also needed to really get into the performance, to feel the relationship with your sounds. I see the sounds that I record and that I use in my pieces, they have a life of their own. Any violin player or any singer can tell you, you know, that the voice has a bit of a life of its own, that you have to, you cannot just say do this because you have to learn its space, you have to learn its character, what it wants. You can't just do anything because it has a life of its own. That is why I still believe that the word interaction or engagement is very correct rather than control. And this idea that in order to have this really deep sense for your sounds, if it helps you to think that they are alive, that can really help you with your focus, with your concentration. And it's an interesting thing because it's very easy to laugh about it and say, oh, come on, don't be so superstitious. But if you really go into something that you really like, this kind of love also projects a lot of goodness in there. And if you don't do that, the music will not sound that well, you know. So if you get in a good mood by doing it, what's wrong about it? And to tell you one more example about it, I just went two or three weeks ago, Sony in Paris has a media lab. And one of the projects they do is they have this Ibo, the dog, that the robot dog that they teach. Yeah, I know this. And so they teach it like quite amazing stuff, especially the Luke Stales who runs the lab is very interested in, you know, learning process that teach themselves to learn, so to say. And one of the project is the Ibo, the robot dog. And now the last thing they showed was that they had worked together with a group of design students. And one of the design students had made a swimming suit for Ibo, the dog. And so they could put the dog into a basin of water without it being drowned and blowing up in fire. And then so they could put it in the water and it would learn to swim, apparently. Now, that is all great, but the best part was to look at the professor who runs this project, whose name I forget at the moment, and the woman who had made the swimming 
soon. Uh, when the dog was to be taken out of the water, she was ready with a towel, standing like, you know, she was receiving the baby, and he was like getting this, this dog from, from the water as if he was carrying a living be uh, uh, being. Now these people deal with mathematics, with logical systems, with you know total non-superstition-prone uh, minds every day, and and you see them treat a piece of machinery like suddenly it has gotten more life than there is. Yeah, but it's obviously very important what this piece of machinery looks like and um, what you have in your hands. If it's if it's a dog or if it, if it were just a piece of a piece of um, computer connected uh, wires, whatever, then perhaps nobody would stand there with a towel and waiting for it outside. And also, <coughs> with your instrument, I think um, what you just described with this um, animistic approach to a, to a computer, um, this, is this is very much um, dependent on the interface with which you talk to the computer. So um, do you also have this image in mind when you check your emails and you just touch your trackpad? Um, well, I think that um, the, the, it's not just a visual, I mean, if I think of the music instrument, uh, it is actually the sound that, that becomes, uh, you know, a partner and, and something that has this extra load. And um, it is true that um, we have experimented in the 90s with interfaces where, you know, you would make something look very technical. And another time we have made uh, the same interface, but it was put inside a little baby doll. Like this, you know, you know, these very realistic looking babies. And so we had put sensors in the hands and, and there was accelerometers. So if you would rock the baby, it would play sounds or it would start vibrating if you would uh, rock it too hard. If you would cover the eyes, there would be projections all over in the room that as if it was starting to dream. And it was very interesting that indeed, you know, the people would kick the ball and that would make sounds and they would, you know, be technical with the technical stuff and they would yeah. be very caring with the baby. You're right about, about the visual side of it, but uh, as a musician, I can tell you that, you know, if you have like a real, you build up a real relationship with your instrument, uh, the instrument becomes a kind of baby too, you know, you, you're, <laughs> and in the exhibitions we've seen that um, the more fragile you make the instrument, the more inviting it is to people to also have a, like a delicate approach. We have these little webs of very thin wires, and you see like pretty rough kids, you know, still try to to deal with it in a decent way. Whereas you have, you see the science museums that have you know like built their instruments like extremely you know proved to to all, all kind of vandalism that it's an invitation to try to break it. So we, we which, have which, which, uh, should, which sometimes is also very, very, very good for music if you really try to, to fight with yeah. the interface. So yeah. It's fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I but, mean, but let's maybe just have a look at your baby, uh, yes. <laughs> which you brought, yeah. because we're we're not running out of time, but we already spent half of the interview. Oh yeah. And we would I, I would like to show to everybody um, these two interfaces which you've brought: the hands in the first place and the crackle synthesizer. Yeah. Also, um, I think if we can maybe focus. Nico, if we can focus on on the um, but hands with maybe, the camera. Uh, maybe we should check if there's any questions so far. Because yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the screen all the time. I see four images, but everybody's sitting there and listening, I hope. <laughs> and I don't see any arms rising. So if there's any questions to Michelle so far, please uh, interrupt. Fine to have first the example. Okay. To have which example? The hands. First examples. Okay. Um, we're continuing with uh, a, s a short demo of the hand. And I hope we can broadcast the sound as well. I'll turn down our microphones. Um, I don't know. Maybe leave it open. Or? Yeah, just I, I, I turn it. I turn the microphones okay. very low. Yeah. So that we can. So that we don't get a feedback.
Nico, can you, can you focus on, on the hands? Like, for me, it's easy to see, but for the others who've never seen the hands, it may be good to, to come really close to it. So I can see a number of switches underneath each finger, three or four for each finger, and then lots of switches for the thumbs, and there's microphones attached to it. Oh yeah, <laughs> several microphones. The sonar between the two. The two th there's a sonar yeah. sensor between between the two um, hands. So that measures distance. And, and so, do you also so have I can. Sorry. You also have this. Uh, yeah, there is also tilt uh, tilt sensors here under the thing. So that's it. So um, I can uh, speak in the microphone that is attached to it, and uh, hopefully it will record in memory. I can, uh, and so then I can. But I think you need a wider, uh, so I can only see something. Else. The it will, re the it will so record in memory. Can, uh, so can, can uh, speak in the microphone that it will. Uh, I can, I can, I can uh, speak in the microphone that. So I don't know if, if the image goes as slow as I see it here, then, then you're missing a lot of movement uh, in the demo. I, I try and make it faster. Because I'm stretching to the sound. So I can scratch to it. I can also, um, you know, change, the, uh, hopefully, 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 treat the direction of the sound. Very simple. I sing a long tone like, <laughs> oh, this needs to be funny. <laughs> Artifacts there. Anyway, it is possible to record live, but I can also call up sounds that are already in the system, and uh, like in this way. here I think I mean most of these movements are fluid movements and I don't think you guys can see it there but uh, <laughs> like every little change here will have a change in sound <laughs> Does anybody have, have a question on, on, on this interface, or would you maybe prefer to have a, have a close look at it, or just say what you want? I'm, talk, I'm talking to everybody now, not only to Michelle. <laughs> They're clapping their hands. Would you say that, that this is a unique interface 
which is only, I, I mean, you only, you're the only one playing this instrument, the hands, in the world, or is there any, anybody else playing it? Um, well, the, 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 like Edwin van der Heide the, is a guy who has worked also a lot with Atao Tanaka, and, um, and he has used a, a variation of this instrument, and um, there's been similar instrument developed, but actually right now the tendency is to develop uh, instruments with less sensors. Um, we, we are really having uh, more work done on what can you do with, with simple sensor instruments, like what is the information that you can get from one sensor. We were very much stimulated by uh, Christina Anderson, who joined us uh, a number of years ago, who wanted to do a project with, uh, for children called the Ensemble, yeah. where each garment, it was like a dressing up party for children in like t way too big clothes, and each garment should have one sensor, and, and it would just, um, uh, you know, change. Uh, what, what, what's a garment? I don't get the word. It's garment. a piece of cloth, like ah. like a, a shirt okay, or a yeah. trouser, and um, and so she wanted to have like a little hat that could sing a melody, and just have one accelerometer in it. And she was uh, kind of critical of our approach to use multi-sensor instruments like this. And we had many reasons, good reasons to believe in a multi-sensor approach, but it was a good challenge to be criticized in a good way because uh, we indeed, uh, Frank and I, Frank Valdez and I, who have developed a lot of this, we went into uh, looking what can you get from one sensor because if that is sufficient, you can build much simpler instruments that would be easier to give to other people. And for instance, at the moment in the Musikgebouw there's the Stein uh, uh, electronic instrument uh, exhibition. Yeah. And it has some of the prototypes of, you know, early prototypes of some of those instruments. And the idea is that that there's a lot of theory to be really developed about how do you, you know, translate gestures into music. And it's not about mapping. Mapping is like, you know, you pull a line out and you you, you move that line to another point. It's, it's really about what is this? What, what does it mean that you start a movement like this? There's a departure in the movement. So you could start analyzing the pattern of departure, the direction, the speed, and immediately, like a, a split second, maybe 20, 30 uh, milliseconds after his departure, you could draw some conclusions that are um, changing the way the rest, the following part of the gesture is being interpreted. So I would be for, you know, like a, a much more dynamic uh, interpretation of gestures that is not simply about mapping, but it, it's really looking into meaning than just like parametrical uh, logic. Yeah. And uh, that is very easily said. I'm, I'm actually picked up this challenge and, and I'm working on what, what I call intention space theory, which is about, you know, that, that these are all movements in space and and you have an intention. That is the, the, the nucleus of this. You, you and what is your intention, and how will the technology deal with that intention? And so it is something between the logic, the mathematics of it, and the, of the technology, and the psychology of, you know, how how do you have an idea, and how do you want to get it somewhere? So the, the, there is in the interpretation of a gesture, there should be more than just translation or mapping. Yeah, I've also seen a um, a quote by you. I, I found a quote by you on the Stein site actually. Where you said that it's um, that it's uh, easy to transfer emotions through a sensitive in instrument, or yeah, you, you you say that that especially this this um, communication of emotion is um, is um, is made made possible by by a, by a sensitive a sensitive controller or a sens sensitive in instrument. Yeah, and I wonder what exactly you mean by this by this emotion. Um, Communication. Yeah. Well, if, if for instance you, you have a, a, a sensor that just um, let through, a bit like the images here. Uh, now, with images, it's a bit different. Uh, with image, you can, if I sit still like this or like this, it means something, but a still in sound doesn't exist. And if you stop sound, there is no image anymore, there's no sound image. And if you want to have sound stop, you have to create a loop. To suggest the yeah, sound because it's always linked to time. Yeah. And so is not and that is a, that makes that if that time is not fluid, if it's interrupted, or if it's not sampled right, you will miss a lot of information. 
And I think there is a lot of, um, you know, you can say in big movements there is information, but in music there's a lot of information in detail. You know, like if, if you, you play a, a sequence or a musical phrase, you know, doing it a little bit faster or uh, doing an accelerando or, or stopping a little bit and going on, but like in a fraction of a second has a meaning. You know, in, in rhythm, uh, in cyclic music, like if, if you, in the terms of funk, you speak of a groove, a groove is not made in seconds, it's made in split seconds. So what I meant to say that, that you know, to have like a real musical feeling uh, uh, occur and be translatable, you need an, an, an interface that is extremely rapid. You know, it was not like sen you have a sensitive interface in the sense and it will sense your emotions. That yeah, is a little exactly. bit... It's, it's, it's no, 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 like, it's like not, this, it's yeah. not very... If, if we have formulated it like that, it should be really changed because it is meant... Uh, with sensitive, it was meant... Because probably it's in the context of speed, in, in of timing. And uh, and sensitivity of an interface is then, is, a, is a, you know, a function of the timing. Yeah. And, so not a, and not in the more literary and poetical the, the, sense. The, the, the touch way. is being... Or the, 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 yeah, the, the touching of the, of the surface of the, of the instrument is somehow communicated. I got it like... No, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, yeah. From, yeah. A, I'm yeah. from the 50s and 60s, but I'm not that much a hippie <laughs> that I would say it's all about sense and stuff. Mm. Yeah, any questions so far? I, I, can, I can see that, um, that in Dan they have some um, audio problems. I hope you can follow us nevertheless. I don't see your, in your image anymore. But... Um, there are no questions so far. I could make a small gap and make possible. We could look at some images otherwise. Yeah. Michel has also brought some images with him. Okay, Dan has just switched off the camera for bandwidth reasons. Um, oh, there is some. Okay. Um, I, I brought the images, but also. Oh, ah, there is um, Miss Jin Yoon Kim. If you would just. Ask a question. It's yours. We don't hear anything. We don't hear anything from uh, from Cologne. Ah. Okay, okay, there doesn't seem to be any. Maybe they can climb. Ah. This is something. I, I, um, the sound was interrupted very often, uh, which is probably almost uh, about the question that you are posing. Uh, if I understand well, you're, you're looking for the, the cultural character of uh, gesture and whether an instrument can bridge this uh, multicultural problem. Is that correct? Can you... Uh, Confirm that this 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 was your question more or less. Yeah. 